Welcome to BSB Must Reads, where we tell you all the books that you must be reading. Today, I have with me J.C. Morrison. You are reading from your newest book out today, A Perfect yeah. Fifth. Very exciting. I it love is. this book. It's so new and different and unique, and I think it's unlike anything readers will have read before. So. I'm super excited for it. How are you doing on release day? Are you excited? Are you nervous? Do you feel like you've, you've been here and done this before that you're you're a pro now? Oh no, I'm still excited and nervous. Um, I just even getting the box of books, I got so excited. I posted everything on Facebook and I forgot to say, and it won't be available until <laughs> September 1st uh, on both strokes, but um, you know, people, people are kind of more used to it than I am, I guess. And they all seem to know that was the case. So yeah, oh, I'm super excited. And uh, I hope everybody enjoys the book as much as I enjoyed writing it. I love that. Here's a box of books you can't buy. But here it is. <laughs> no, look, here I am with my book. You can't have it yet. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, that's great. Perfect. Um, all right. I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself for readers who may not have met you yet. And I would love to hear um, about A Perfect Fifth, and then you're going to do a reading from us. I am. So um, I'm coming to you from beautiful Colorado. Um, I've, I've transitioned from being a big city gal in Texas to being a mountain woman uh, here at 9,200 feet. Uh, I just love it up here. It's a great place to, to hang out, to hike, to just sit there and watch the mountain. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful life. I really do enjoy it. So The Perfect Fifth is my fifth book, um, coincidentally. Uh, my four other novels include The Found Jar and The Love and Courage series, which is a historical romance. This particular story, A Perfect Fifth, is set in the 1970s. It takes place mostly in London and uh, includes four long-term, long-time friends, two of whom are about to be married. And the assumption is that the other two will soon follow suit. But things change when a fifth person is introduced to the group. So um, that's kind of the setup for the whole story. Uh, each of the characters is, is very different. Um, and the fifth who comes into the story really shakes things up. So I'll do a little reading and then we can talk more about uh, who the characters are and why they are the way they are. So returning to London from New York via luxury cruise, Constance Holston meets Zara Keller, who is playing piano in the ship's lounge. After observing both Zara's incredible talent and her casual approach to an apparent affair, Constance invites her to a party at the country home of her best friend, Lady Gillian Stansfield. Constance secretly hopes that Zara's attitude can demonstrate for Gillian how to mix love and work, and that Zara's romantic music can influence Lady Stansfield to put aside her studies and her responsibilities for her home, Fuller Hill Manor, in favor of deepening her relationship with bad boy Clive Nyes, who is the fourth of their group. So this scene takes place after the cruise as Constance and her fiance Nelson arrive with Zara at Fuller Hill Manor. Zara's mouth was slightly agape. The estate was imposing from a distance, and it was understandable that someone seeing it for the first time, especially someone unfamiliar with the wonderful English manor homes like Fuller Hill, would find it overwhelming. Zara apparently felt this and more as they pulled into what Nelson thought of as his reserved parking spot. Face pressed against the window, Zara muttered, fuck me while gawking at the house from the back seat of the car. Taking the luggage from the boot, Nelson heard Constance speaking, but couldn't make out the words. Zara's voice was clearer. No, really, I'm fine to sleep out here in the car. I've done it before and in worse weather. This place is, uh, it's, it's really not my style, you know? Constance's door opened, she went around to the back, pulling Zara out and walking her a few steps away from the house chatting animatedly the whole time. Nelson assumed Constance was giving their guest a bit of a pep talk. So he took a load to the door. 
noting as he returned that Zara was smoothing her clothes and fluffing her hair as Constance was trying to brush some kind of makeup on her. Smiling to himself at the thought of making a silk purse for Masao's ear, he set down the last bag. She wasn't their first American, but they hadn't had many, and every other one had been either wealthy or intellectual. Nelson got the sense that Zara was neither, which could account for her consternation. Though at least she shared the appropriate reaction to Fuller Hill, total and complete awe. He joined the ladies, taking Constance's hand as they entered the residence, half listening as she pointed out the stunning decor they'd all come to take for granted. Zara's head swiveled practically nonstop as Constance took her past rooms containing comfortable reading nooks, overflowing bookshelves, layered rugs, and deep sofas and patterned fabrics. Trinkets of, trinkets of porcelain and pottery were spaced among the plants, candlesticks, and decorative boxes. Some rooms were decidedly more masculine with exposed beams and stronger colors. One in particular boasted mounted antlers and a bare rug. Above a small table was an ancient shield and two crossed swords. The walls of the hallway were lined with portraits and they passed a full suit of armor at one corner. Constance stopped beside a large tapestry, one of Jillian's favorites. It was a copy of the famous Lady and the Unicorn, presenting the sixth sense, understanding or in intuition. There's a debate about what these words, amansoul désir, are supposed to mean. Constance pointed at the French phrase stitched on the wall hanging a little more than halfway up. Some say they should be translated as to my soul desire. Others say they mean love desires only beauty of the soul. Zara seemed impressed. She studied the image for a moment. You know, she said musingly, there was something a lot like this in my childhood home, although it was much smaller. She used her hands to indicate a size, which was less than half of the hanging at Fuller Hill. Really? Constance's tone was either intrigued or skeptical. Yeah, and the subject matter was entirely different. Do tell, Nelson and Constance said together. It's an allegorical depiction of man's inhumanity to man about how some will sacrifice their honor even to win something that's ultimately quite meaningless. Constance gave a slight tilt to her head. What was the title of this piece? Zara seemed pleased they'd gotten to the point. Dogs playing poker? she said. Nelson brought his hand up to his mouth, but it was too late. He burst into laughter, and after a few seconds of affected dismay, Constance joined in. The couple guided Zara to the terrace, knowing that next to her laboratory, the out of doors was Jillian's favorite place. On a beautiful day like this, she'd certainly be out tramping through the woods if she hadn't been expecting their company. Seated at the outdoor dining area, Jillian's back was to them. She hadn't turned, indicating her attention was elsewhere. Constance moved, leaving Zara slightly behind Nelson as she stepped up to Jillian's side. Hello, dearest, she said, touching Jillian's shoulder. Jillian rose and they embraced. I'm so glad you're back, she said, giving Nelson a teasing little shake, she asked. But where have you been? I've been wanting to get out all morning. Get changed at once and we'll go for a picnic. He looked to Constance, but she'd gone back for Zara, who seemed uncertain as she approached with her head down and her steps hesitant. Oblivious, Constance spoke confidently. Jillian Stansfield, let me introduce Sarah Keller. I met her on the cruise and she's absolutely an amazing pianist. I'm sure we could persuade her to pay, play for us later, won't you, Zara? Oh, and she's auditioning at the Royal College of Music next week. Isn't that fabulous? Zara. This is my dearest friend, Lady Jillian Stansfield. Zara's head came up slowly, her eyes finding Jillian's. Jillian's lips parted as if in surprise by the arrival of someone unexpected. Nelson was quite taken aback. He'd never seen two women look at each other with such intensity. If it hadn't been a clear day and they'd been a man and a woman, he might have expected a thunderclap. They spoke at the same time, Zara saying, do I know you? While Jillian asked, have we met? He and Constance chuckled at the coincidence, 
But Jillian and Zara continued to stare at each other for a few more seconds. Zara recovered first. Shaking her head, she murmured, no, I would have remembered. I always love it when they end on a great one-liner. <laughs> yes, when you know someone would have remembered, <laughs> it's a good moment. For sure. Um, okay, so we've been teasing the readers a little bit um, with this concept. You mentioned, you know, that you have these two couples and Zara who um, is the perfect fifth or, you know, so it may seem. Um, and she kind of shakes them up a little. And I, I don't want to give too much away because I feel like there's so much that, you know, readers will get from finding out on their own. But could you tell us a little bit about how it is that Zara ends up in their lives? What is it that motivates her to become um, so, so close with these two couples? Yeah, I, I think when Zara gets invited for the weekend, she, she understands that she's there primarily to be the entertainment. She's going to play piano for them and, you know, kind of keep the party lively. And she's comfortable with that, uh, especially around these people who are so wealthy and so different from her. She likes Constance, whom she met on the cruise. She likes Nelson when she meets him. But after meeting Jillian, she feels something much stronger. Mm -hmm. So I think she stays on partly to see what will happen between them, but also because as she, as she talks to Jillian, she sees that Jillian's trying to find a life that has more meaning than what's expected of her. Mm -hmm. and, and Zara respects that. She wants to help. Um, but this this group of friends have known each other since childhood, and so they're kind of a package deal. <laughs> I think we all know people like that who kind of come with friends. Uh, and so that means that if Zara's going to be around Jillian, she's also going to have to be around with them. For sure. That makes total sense. Okay, so most sapphic fiction books, um, at least kind of in, you kind of cross genres in this one, but at least in in romances particularly, don't tend to show significant heterosexual couples. Um, and I think that's one of the things that makes this book so interesting and so unique um, is that you do have these four friends who, at least at the start of the book, um, by all appearances, are heterosexual couples. Um, is that something that you decided in advance that you wanted to kind of make sure that was on the page in a way that isn't typical for a romance, a sapphic romance at least? Yeah, um, I think, I know a lot of people uh, create worlds that are entirely or predominantly lesbian in their books. And I enjoy reading those very much, but I wanted to show a little bit more of the world the way it really is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of us have heterosexual friends and we certainly need them as our allies you know, in the struggle, uh, whether political or personal struggle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it was deliberate by the time I got to writing, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Um, so tell us where you got the idea. Um, I mean, it feels like this one might be one that germinated over time instead of coming to you in a flash. Um, but tell us about how it, how it happened. Um, Oddly, the ideas came to me in a dream, and a lot of my ideas start in that form. But uh, in this particular dream, it was more like a sci-fi story um, that there were four people, each of whom was like a genius in their own field. Um, but as a group, they were sort of disorganized in how they went about using their talents. And then a fifth person came in and sort of straightened things out. So that was the dream. It was more like sci-fi superhero save the world sort of stuff. But, you know, as often happens in writing, the final product turned out really different. And, you know, I am a romance writer at heart. So I hope readers will pick it up for that because there's music, there's drama, there's sacrifice. It's in Europe. And of course, there's love. So ultimately, uh, it's, it's still a romance, even though there are some different couples in there. And who knows, there may or may not be a superpowers plot twist in there. <laughs> That's awesome that it started out in a totally different genre, a totally different kind of book, 
Uh, no, and I've never I've never written anything sci-fi. Although you know, someday I may, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't going to be this one. So, all right. Well, you got to take lots of naps to to start those those dream ideas again because that's awesome. Um, so Sarah is such a compelling character, and in a lot of ways, she's the character that kind of holds the whole book together and all these, um, both, both the couples and Jillian particularly. Um, how did you go about conceiving of her? I think I wanted music in the book, even though that wasn't in the superhero dream, <laughs> but, but uh, I, I wanted there to be music. I don't know why. It just seemed like there was sort of a theme uh, song playing in my head through the whole thing. So, so I I needed to find a musician, and um, somehow the cruise uh, that kind of starts the story um, came into my head as as a way to do that. And then oddly, I actually took a cruise. <laughs> after I'd finished the book or all but finished it. And there was a female pianist on the cruise and uh, we, we talked about the book a little bit, but, but yeah, for Zara, um, I don't know that I deliberately set up to start them out or to, to end them up as an opposites attract kind of story, but it definitely is. She's so different from, from Jillian and, and from the rest of, of her friends. She has reason not to trust people and especially wealthy people. Um, she spent some time on the streets um, just when her life was kind of getting back together. She got victimized again. But she sees Jillian as one of those rare people who doesn't really flaunt her money or her society uh, position. So um, I think that is part of their attraction or part of Sarah's attraction to her. Working on the cruise ship she was just sort of adrift, um, trying to get enough money to stay in London and do her audition and so on. Um, so she hopes that that might, you know, she gets on at the Royal College of Music, that might change her life again. I think she also thinks it'd be really nice if Jillian would change her life again too, but uh, they are so different that uh, I don't think she's real optimistic about it, at least at first. Yeah. Yeah, Jillian has a real journey in this book. Um, and that's something that I love about your work because your character journeys are always really intense. Um, you write about a lot of themes and a lot of characters who experience some hard stuff, right? So um, you write a lot about homophobia and trauma um, and childhood experiences. And I'm wondering, why do you think readers are drawn to characters who have those experiences? Is it that we just want to root for a survivor um, or is there something else about um, characters who are a little bit bruised um, that draw us to them? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I, think, I think a lot of people like to root for a survivor and I think we're all bruised in some way. Um, so it gives us a way to relate and a way to have sympathy for the characters. We don't have to necessarily have experienced uh, specific challenges that are that the characters do. Like we don't have to have had childhood trauma or, or experience a dev devastating injury or something like that. But we can still feel sympathy with pain and we can still feel sympathy with sadness. And I think that's something that's so important in our world today that we maybe don't have enough of. You know, um, I think people read to escape, but I also think we need to be encouraged and we need to be inspired. And I think showing characters who overcome whatever hard knocks life has thrown at them can, can do that for us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially for the LGBTQ community too. Um, exactly, yeah, more, very much so. More mm -hmm. important. Well, thank you so much, JC. This has been wonderful. Please do check out A Perfect Fifth, available on the Bone Strokes Books website and everywhere books are sold September 13th. Check it out. And her next book, her sixth, may or may not have sixth in the title. You'll have to. No, I don't no. think so. It's to be a trend. <laughs> this was sort of a this was sort of a multiple joke. You know, perfect fifth, the fifth book, and a perfect fifth is a musical interval, and that's 
that's the way Zara introduces it is as in, in addition to her being the perfect fifth. So <laughs> thank you for it. doing this, Sandy. And thanks to everybody for watching and for supporting us. I know all the writers and all the readers, we, we appreciate you guys at Bold Strokes and thanks so much for being here today. Awesome. We'll see you next time. You bet.